Welcome to another episode of Another Fat Guy Cooks. Today, we are going to be doing Prime and Nourishment with Brian Saunders. Say hello, Brian. Howdy. <laughs> now, for anybody who doesn't know, I, I, I have no idea how to describe you, if I'm completely honest, because I've done as much research as I could do over the last week. Because I um, I knew of you, but um, didn't know you know in depth of, of any of your work. So I've um, I've checked out the documentary that um, our mutual friend uh, Jason Fury sent me, oh. um, and I've gone back through quite a lot of your your older stuff and, and whatever. But I mean, I suppose just an artist would be the easiest way to put it. But um, you 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 were a lot more than that. I mean, how would you how would you sort of describe yourself? Well, someone not too long ago called me a folk artist, and I thought that was best. I never wanted to be like a insane artist or a naive artist because I went to college for drawing and mm -hmm. I learned about art history and stuff. And I say I'm experimental, maybe experimental folk artist because I don't do like galleries and uh, stuff. I, I'll do occasional museum exhibitions when I'm invited, like cultural centers and like psychology museums, stuff like that. But I really never wanted to be labeled as like a, uh, I forget what they call it. It's like not naive, but uh, artistry. Outsider art, that kind of thing. Yes, like, yes, outsider. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't want to fall into that, and so uh, yeah, well, I, I tried to stay away from that a minute ago when I was because I I know it's a it's just such a. Well, I mean, pigeonholes are are pointless for most things. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. But I like to do drawing. I've been drawing myself every day for long time since 95 every single day well, this is this is what i think you're probably um probably most well known for is mm. is your uh since uh how, how old were you when you started uh i was say 95 i was 26 okay so i, I just the, this last march was my 26 year anniversary of doing it so half of my i've done it for over half of my life now so every single day self-portrait no matter what yeah. No matter what sort of how you're feeling, what you're doing, even if yeah. it's something like on the back of a beer mat or if it's if it's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But mostly it's most all of them are in these books. OK. Oh, it might not even. Yeah. Most of them are in these kind of that's crazy. I absolutely love the effect that your camera's giving. <laughs> I don't think it could be any more any more fitting. <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, yeah. They, uh, but if I do it on another piece of paper, I'll like glue it in that book or something. Mm -hmm. Not too much. I I always try to use these same same books, um, but uh, I'll use all different types of art supplies like body fluids or office supplies or paints or these books are really durable i've got one book that i shot a whole bunch of times with a pistol and rifle and um you, one of the bullets got stuck it like oh, the wow book stopped the bullet so then i like put tape on both sides of the clear tape so you could see where it like actually stopped yeah. the bullet. i think i think i remember reading as well that you consider all of the uh, the self portraiture and stuff like that to be um kind of one one piece of work yeah as well, which is why you've never you've never like sold any self portraits or anything no, like that i have I, oh you I, have oh okay yeah uh see they are i did in the beginning it was one work of art but then i felt like different different things have come up in life and so i've been changing like the, the, the meaning of it changes over time. Mm -hmm. And so the, how I do it now is like, I uh, do them all in the book, but I've sold some to some people, like friends have done some for different people, but um, I have to do two that day, one yeah. for the book and then I give one to somebody else. But then uh, sometimes, uh, one time I had a gallery representing me and then I sold some through them and then, uh, but the thing, one of the ways I reasoned selling them was because I was afraid that what's keeping them all together would make them a marketable thing. Like after I died, somebody could have take all of them and like say, oh, here's all of these self portraits of whole life work. And then it yeah. would be some type of product that people could sell to somebody else. And then I was like, well, if I 
spread some out like a few each year, then there's no way they can put them all back together again, you know, and that way it'll keep it true to my own self. And then plus my, some of my uh, fans have had like, they wanted to buy one, but I won't necessarily want to sell them one. So what I'll do is I'll do one just for them. Like mm -hmm. one of my uh, fans up in Canada, was lost in the woods. I think this might have been the last one that I've done. Uh, she got lost in the woods and had to be rescued by the, um, you know, the, the rescue teams had to come yeah, out yeah. searching for her. And so then she was lost in the woods overnight. And so then for her, what I did was I went into woods that I'd never been in and went where I couldn't see any signs of people at all, any signs of mankind at all. Yeah. Human humankind and then uh drew a really nice picture just being peaceful kind of meditative sitting in the woods and then i did her did, did that for her so that way she would have a nice picture to, go, to kind of go with her traumatic experience you know yeah, that's a great idea uh -huh. yeah i mean i um through the documentary and and through um obviously you know just just going through the internet and bringing a few of them up i mean the ranges of of some of the ways that you envision yourself are remarkable i mean i've seen ones where you are a dot on a piece of paper to ones where they are quite sort of almost just like a classic self-portrait yeah. and and yeah and i assume all of these are just mainly just state dependent on yeah. your your mood that day and the things yeah. that have happened and yeah it's a uh, my physical condition usually starts it off and then it'll change between whatever I'm experiencing. If I'm thinking of a dream, I might make it more surrealistic. Or if I'm thinking of a memory, I'll make it more like illustrative. Or if I'm wanting to do something, you know, if I'm thinking about plans in the future, it'll change. Like this, I try to just be, it, it just happened naturally, but it, I came about forming like different, using styles, I guess you'd call it, different mm -hmm. styles as w ways to best interpret different uh, elements of experience or types of experiences. So that way it just comes natural. And that way I can do the same thing over and over again and always get different results. So in the beginning, everyone said, oh, you're, 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 you're this is wrong. You, you, um, this is not healthy and stuff. You're only drawing yourself. You're, you're stuck in, in, on yourself. Like, even if I was not um, flattering myself, you know, if I was yeah. like really brutal looking at myself, people would still say like, this is, you're stuck in only doing this. You got to get outside of yourself and you're stuck in these books and all this stuff. But by doing that, I, I just naturally formed this, way of doing all these different styles and repeating the same behavior they used to they, they say you repeat the same behavior over and over again expecting a different results insanity but if you really pay attention to what's happening inside your brain is every time you repeat that behavior it's going to be a little different no matter what you do even if you're wearing the same clothes sitting in the same position with the same same pencil uh amount of sharpness same distance from the mirror everything the same same weight same food everything you're still gonna if you really pay attention there'll be something different that's gonna come out in that experience uh, and i just let it happen naturally and uh i don't but but sometimes i say that but then i'll break that rule too i won't always do like that sometimes i'll say if i'm having see like a lot of people they'll think about art therapy and they'll say, okay, you do art therapeutically and that's from the pos position of the victim. So you'll say like something happened to me, so I'm gonna deal with it and use art therapeutically. But more than that, I use it therapeutically as more of a, a predator aggressive control, a way of like therapeutically um, helping my psychology uh, and my physiology and stuff to keep me from doing bad things and mm -hmm. negative things instead of, I'm not, not just always the victim. So a lot of times I will, if I make a rule, I will always break it, but yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, leading, leading, leading on from that, I mean, um, you, I think you've described yourself, I think, a couple of times as, if not being a psychopath, having psychopathic tendencies, mm. at least. And um, I think when you were younger, you actually spent uh, a decent portion of time in, uh, in jail for, I'm assuming, mm. things which probably came from, you know, not controlling that side yeah. of you. Um, yeah. If you want to talk about that a little bit, because I, I find that really fun. I mean, obviously, you know, the the idea of the show is, uh, and I think the reason why you you, you seem quite uh, quite happy to do this was the, um, you know, it's crime and nourishment based on um, picking your last meal, why you would end up hypothetically on death row. Well, you, you have a much better view into that than anybody else that I've interviewed. Um they uh yeah when i was younger i was really i had some issues and stuff and uh i did i was like a bully and i was mean and i would do practical joke mean practical jokes and stuff like this i was like not really i didn't have empathy like like a lot of stuff uh i had empathy for animals but my cousins and stuff didn't and so I was exposed to things that were like really bad and uh, then uh, I guess growing up I was you know you know starting around the time I started smoking I started getting in trouble with the police and uh, breaking into houses and just doing different things and uh, vandalizing stuff and just really just acting out so then by the time I turned 21 I got into a knife fight in Washington, D.C., and uh, stabbed the guy a bunch of times and um, went to prison uh, in D.C. At the time, I don't know if it's still the same. D.C. is not a state, so it's all federal. It's like yeah. federal justice system, and they didn't want violent offenders put in the same jail as, like, bank fraud people or right. uh, uh, lawyers or congressmen with drunk driving problems and stuff like this. They wouldn't want the most violent people. So uh, after two weeks in the D.C. jail, they would automatically send you to D.C.'s prison if you were arrested with violent, uh, pro vi uh, a violent uh, incident. And so I was charged with um, two armed robberies and assault with intent to commit robbery while armed, which carry... 15 to 45 years each. So I was looking at like almost a hundred and some years. If I was black, I would still, I would be dead or still in there probably. I, yeah. Because the, and the longer you stay in there, the more chances you're going to have to hurt somebody else in there. And so there's a lot of people I saw that would not even go to trial but then have to hurt somebody in there and then get charged and go to court for that and then get sentenced. And so then once they get a hold of you, it's a lot easier for them to keep you. Uh, but the, because I was white, they really uh, let me off really easily. I got two years total, uh, but uh, wow. in DC, you only had to do one third at the time. I don't know if it's still the same, but I did eight months out of two years. And um, I mean, there were black people that had two, two armed robberies, assault with intent to commit robbery or alarm. They would get e easily 15 years. Most time they get 45 years, uh, but then they would only have to do a third. So they'd get out in 15 if they didn't get in trouble and stuff like that. So eight months is like really. And uh, so I've had this. Hmm? No, carry, carry on. Oh. I was going to say, so I've all ever since then, I've had this inherent knowledge of the white privilege and stuff that everyone's talking about. And uh, these this this day and age, I know it in every ounce of my being. I know a lot about how much privilege I have. And so uh, I just uh, really I tell this story over and over again. I enjoy telling it to people just because people don't really think about it. And when I went to prison, they would they would say. Well, like the, the 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 like the other prisoners, predominantly black, would say like, and the guards would say, white people don't last forty eight hours as life expectancy of a white person in this federal prison for D.C. And they would use that as like a way to just just kind of like it's like a psychological weapon against you. You're not going to last forty eight hours, white boy. You're not going to last and stuff like that. But then they once I got to to prison from the DC jail, people started saying, you're white, you won't be here long. So I was thinking, well, 
they're saying that because of this, you know, these threats and stuff that I've yeah. been getting and everything like that. But when I went, ended up going to court, I had a public defender and uh, he uh, it took every ounce of my being not to attack him in court, because the first thing he said when it was our time to talk, he said, Your Honor, as you can see, my client is white and he's in a predominantly black facility in Lorton and you know how violent it is and stuff like that. And I thought, oh, my God, but the judge was black. And I thought, what, what the fuck is this guy doing? And I mean, it took every ounce of strength I, and uh, humility or humbleness, uh, meekness, submission, submissiveness, uh, masochism or something, every ounce of it to not just elbow him as hard as I could and just assault him right there. But I just something happened. I just put all of this on me to not resist and then the, and the judge said okay if i let you go for uh sentencing uh he asked me to give us you know if i had anything to say and i said sorry and apologized to the victim and all this type of stuff and then uh, he said well if i let you go will you come back for sentencing and i was like sure and i'd been there eight months so then when i came back for sentencing they said okay time served like that but if i was black there is no way I, they wouldn't have even had that excuse uh to to use in court I was shocked, but uh, and ever since then, I've just had this really inherent understanding of uh, white privilege. Uh, just seeing so much, there was a guy in the same cell block as me. I forget his name now, but uh, he was famous for selling crack to our president, George Bush, uh, Secret Service, so that he could hold up crack on TV and say this was purchased right outside the White House. Like that guy, they just threw him away and uh, never went to court for a long time. He, I think he was like in there for three years before he even went to court or something. And that's when I learned that people could really just disappear. Like if you didn't have any type of um, family or something with some means, uh, you would not be able to call. You wouldn't know who to call, what number to call. Like you'd just be fucked. Like this guy is totally fucked. And um, there was a lot of different things I saw like that that were just – really made a genetic impression on me. It's the only way I can describe it. Like it changed yeah. my DNA. No, that's, that's incredible. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the, I think the justice system in the UK isn't, you know, I, I definitely not perfect. And I think there's a lot of problems in the same way, but every story I hear about the justice system in America, it, it makes me terrified. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, okay, so um, so the idea of the show is obviously, you know, this is what I'm going to make for you your last meal. Now, yeah. if you woke up one day and found yourself on death row, back in jail, what do you think you would have done to get there? Well, this one, I thought, you know, I, I have all different types of art supplies and I can make art with anything, but I feel like if I lost all my art supplies, and and or the will to use them or something if i was separated from them or something i think it would not take much effort at all for me to be able to resort back to being a violent person and just an angry person and and um i've always had uh, dreams of cutting people's heads off this might get a little crazy but I've had oh, no, you go as dark as you want to go <laughs> I've had two dreams this month about cutting people's nightmares about cutting people's heads off. And uh, one of them kind of fits the theme of the show. So I thought, well, I'll use this one for this thing. Okay. I was in prison. And uh, I mean, this was years and years ago. I was in prison, but it's, I guess it's like PTSD or something. It still comes up every now and then, you know, you don't, you don't get away from the, from it. Um, but I was in prison and I needed, I was like tired of getting moved from prison to prison and having to start over again and develop a reputation and stuff or make friends and stuff and just having to start over socially again. And I was like really fed up with it. So I said to myself, when I get in the cell block, I'm going to cut somebody's head off as fast as I can. So that way I can like hold it up and take it around and show everybody. Because usually when something goes down like that, most people will lock themselves in their own cells. Yeah. And then the guards, all the COs, the correctional officers, they all wait in the outside the door of the, of the pod or the cell block and put on their riot gear and stuff. And then when they come in, it's like dominoes and they just use their body weight, just one on top of the other, just like this to just yeah. pound you. So I knew I only had so much time 
to cut someone's in the stream or to cut somebody's head off. And then I th so I had to like really try to think about where all the different muscles it were in the neck were and everything. And then I cut this head off and it was heavier than I thought. And it was like all slippery and stuff, but I was trying to like take it to ev if everyone's cell and where they have the little window yeah. there, and just hold this person that they've been living with for who knows how long, hold their head up to that, their cell and just say, okay, now nobody's going to bother me. This is how I'm socializing into your all's, uh, sphere of whatever this is this is my picket right. <laughs> <laughs> but see in, in, in uh, dc they don't have the death penalty and so uh this wasn't in the dream but this is how it worked in real life the prison was in actually on virginia state property and so when someone some if something like that happened then when they went to court they could get the death penalty because they actually killed somebody in virginia they didn't kill them in dc oh, so it was a way of yeah, so I figured, well, that's something like that. It might, might not likely happen, but... That, it's, that it's, is by far the best answer that I've had on this show <laughs> to that question <laughs> by a million miles. <laughs> I um, right. to say it. <laughs> so so you're, on, you're on death row. You get, yeah. you get your last meal. Anything in the world that you want whatever the the way we do this is that i'll go away after we finished here i'll huh? find whatever i need to find i'll make it and then we'll come back and i will in the most disgusting act of uh sort of torture show you the meal that i've uh, made and then eat it myself in front of you i don't um, think it would be too torturous i'm not expecting it to be that that bad <laughs> <laughs> what would uh, what would your last meal be brian all right. Well, I think because I've thought about this a lot. Now, before you invited me on to the show, I would think of like lobster tail and st stuff like this. Like whenever I'd see this type of question come up, like on cable TV or in a movie or something, I would think like, oh, like st some steak or some lobsters and everything. But practically, I think they don't really would, they wouldn't really give you what you wanted. And if you say like, I want surf and turf, like steak and lobster, all you would get is probably like these little stuffed popcorn shrimp, not stuffed, but little tiny popcorn shrimp with some shriveled up piece of bottom round steak or yeah, something. I, I feel that specificity would be king in this, you know, you want to be as specific as possible to get exactly what you want. Yeah, and I think they wouldn't do it. I think they yeah. just wouldn't do it. And uh, I think that um, the, my thing is, like, you never knew what you were going to get. It was always a surprise each meal in prison. Mm -hmm. you, you would have things that you would like and that things that you would hope for, repeatedly hope for, and then, but then you might be disappointed. You would never know. So I think just being able to name what you wanted to eat and then get that, that would be like really i think super nice because you had no control over over a lot of things like that yeah and so what i think for there's two parts to it the first part of the meal i think was my favorite meal which was um i think they call it crinkly crisps in uh the uk it's like french fries that are like crinkled oh like crinkle chips yeah like um, potato, like like French fries, but crinkly fries. Yeah, crinkly yep. fries. They would take leftover fries from the day night before, and mm. then they would put sausage gravy on top of them Ooh. for breakfast. And it was like really, really good. And uh, that type of a lot of people didn't like it, so I would get like people would just give it to me. Oh, like, everybody's that's like right. my, big, being being a big fat bastard. That's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's leftovers. <laughs> yeah, and, but a lot of meals you. You know, everybody was just eager to get it. And you you would, they had it, a wall in the aisle. You'd like walk down in like a line, single file line, and you put your tray under this slot in this giant wall with a giant slot below it. And then the people behind it would just put on it, whatever they were, and then, you, you know, like an assembly line, but they had this wall so you couldn't see who it is. So everybody would be bent over really trying to look and see then if you saw someone you knew you could like hand them a cigarette or two and then yeah. you could get extra and stuff like that but then uh people uh part of the L the lgbtq this is the second part of the meal the lgbtq okay. uh community uh they always ate together and uh 
Some of them had pimps. Some of them just were on their own. Uh, some of them had um, relationships like part life partners and stuff like that. Yeah. But when it came to the eating, they all ate it together at the same time. Their pimps didn't bother them. Their life partners didn't sit with them and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They ate great. They ate like the best. Like no matter what we be eating, they would always be eating so much better. And um, so like we would have, say we would have like chicken rondole, I think it was called. It was basically just a fried chicken, frozen chicken patty mm-hmm. with maybe like some little sauce on it or something and, and they would have a uh, chick chicken franchise with roasted grapes <laughs> or, or we would get like a, a a piece of liver like cow like a beef liver yeah. on white rice and that's it and they would have like rumaki like little liver with bacon wrapped around it and stuff yeah, like yeah, that yeah. so great but i never I, I i wasn't part of that community and never got to sit over there never got to eat any of this great food so i think for my final meal i would like to eat 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 something from that like like maybe rumaki or something rumaki yeah yeah, yeah. i can do that <laughs> i don't so, know how well they would go together though do you think t- Taste wise, I don't think they, don't think they need to go together. I don't think they need to go together. I think we could just do two separate things, and oh, then yeah. uh, it's your last your last meal. You eat whatever you <laughs> want to eat. <laughs> cool. All right, cool. So yeah. you know, so we're talking like tinkle cut fries with um with leftover. Left, left you left have to like eat them the night before yeah, and have so them left over. Okay, drink <laughs> so leftover leftover crinkle cut fries with yeah. sausage gravy, like that you would have with like biscuits and gravy, like that, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah, okay, That's cool. Not too terribly spicy, hot. Not like really super peppery or something. Okay, so light lightish yeah. on the pepper, yeah. Yeah, and okay. kind of like greasy, the brownish kind of. Uh, mm-hmm. No, no mustard in it. I don't think they they would put mustard in it i know there was a local diner here whenever the gravy would start getting old they would add a little mustard to it to like mask all oh, right okay yeah yeah so well, I, wanna, I wanna get this absolutely perfect so what i'm probably gonna do i mean we've been talking quite a bit on uh, on emails over the last few days uh-huh. and so what i probably do is um i'll talk to you between now and when we make the meal okay. uh, and when i present it with you and just give you a few little options and just make sure i'm doing the right things and and just make sure, sure we get it absolutely uh, absolutely perfect but, was, um, 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 was Doug and Bingo's the only time the people made the food too like or is uh, something Doug, that yeah, I yeah, yeah. To well no D- Doug and Bingo did it and uh, Andy Andrist um, he he also made himself uh, the, the breakfast sandwich so you are if, if you oh, okay. if you want to do it you are welcome to if not I'm, I'm, I'm fine with just presenting you with the food but it's only okay. two people who've ever done that okay. so okay uh, I, w- I wasn't sure so I thought I would ask because I, I, I've for some reason I've never tried to make it again I, I don't or make it myself for the first time mm-hmm. I've ever tried it so I thought the other way of going about it was having you make food using like ingenuity and stuff like the way they would use the metal chairs as like a hot plate and stuff by burning yeah, yeah, yeah. all that stuff but I was like no I'm not gonna make you do all this crazy <laughs> stuff I thought I just although, although I'm really <laughs> I'm really tempted to uh, try and find myself like um uh, an American prison dinner tray online oh. And, oh. and and order and order one of those. Yeah. So I've got so I've got one of oh, those for man. the episode. I think that'll look pretty cool. And oh. then I can have uh, have your left. I can have them in different slots on oh. the prison tray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, chocolate pudding. Then put some chocolate, some chocolate pudding. pudding. Wanted, okay. Uh, maybe like, like a square a square of cornbread or something. Maybe or. Um, no, I don't know about that one. No. Uh, they. Um, one interesting thing that might be neat for to tell people on the show is that yeah. a lot of people use their toilets as refrigerators in prison. And uh, some people would use their toilet as a way to keep their like milk and cartons and yeah. things sealed up cool. But then some people would like have like their toilet would be the refrigerator and then they, they would let other people put their food in it too and then they would share the other person's toilet but then so, so you just put ice in the toilet and then use it as like a cooler ice, it was just cold water like oh okay yeah like it's just naturally cool water wow. like that but to keep like so if you had this i don't 
think we ever had soda cans because people would just rip them in half and cut somebody with them. But yeah, we had like a lot of juice in cartons and milk in uh, those square type of cartons. Mm -hmm. And so people would take like socks and get them wet with cold water and then double them up and then put them over it like a sleeve and then put them in front of like the AC or near the front uh -huh. of the door so that wherever there's a draft. So that yeah. way it would keep them cool. So you didn't have to put them in the toilet, but a lot of people just did it in the toilet. But then some people, this is crazy. Some people used their toilet and refrigerator at the same time. And then some people, <laughs> they've been in, they've been in there so long, this is true. They've been in there so long that they would use their food stuff, storage stuff, to hoard their waste, the stuff that they had put in the toilet so they could use it to like throw on people. And um, I used to do a spoken word uh, piece about this called The Beach and everything, uh, where they would take ramen noodles and I, I called it homemade napalm ramen noodle bombs. And uh, what they would do is they would get the ramen noodles wet and mold them, like if they could have like a, find like a tennis ball or something that's spherical that they could cut in half. And then they would mold it, the ramen noodles into that spherical shape, get two halves of it. Then they could pack their waste in it and stuff. And they would make like toilet paper wicks by twisting the toilet paper really tight, uh, tight, but like double, double yeah. layer, they twist it really twite, tight and then have it stuck out of there and they would light it. And boy, if they've had their feces in there and lit it and throw it at you, you would think it exploded when it hit you. I mean, it would just go. And uh, they had lighter fluid. Somehow, they I don't know if they had gasoline for generators and it would just get passed around or what, but they would mix detergent with uh, fuel and win the feces. And I called it homemade napalm ramen noodle bombs. They would just go do it. And I, I would oh tell my. people, if it gets in your eyes, you're in trouble. You're like in real trouble. <laughs> I, think, I think the only thing like that that I've ever heard of is um, something to do with like uh, potato chip packets where they yeah. would um, like yeah. fill those full of shit and then like put them outside your shit cell and then stamp Stop. on them. Yeah. And then it would yeah. just like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I yeah. mean, if, if you put all the rest of it aside, it's a fantastic idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was the good thing about prison. This it helped me become an artist later on was because uh, it gave me a chance to be, to lose it. Like they took away my physical freedom but it gave me the freedom to lose my mind, like yeah. just let go. But you still had to, you couldn't just let go whenever you wanted. You still had to be like respectful of the people around you and stuff. You were, but you, if, if you were aware of uh, the situation and stuff, you could just go off like and, and make crazy stuff like that and just let loose. And it's not, what are I they going to do? I feel that that's like maybe a release valve that people like could benefit from in real life as well. Like yeah. just, just that maybe having, you know, a few hours a week where you are just allowed to just go fucking insane okay. and, and, and let that helpful. out. It'd be so helpful. Yeah. It'd be helpful. Uh, uh, they, um, I, I, a lot of times I would just scream and rant and rave, not thinking about the future or anything. I'm thinking my future is over. But then once I started doing spoken word and tapping into this anger and stuff, and then I realized, oh, wow, this is coming from this prison stuff. I was like practicing and didn't even know it. You know, I was like. Well, one, one thing that I wanted to get just before, you know, I wanted to, because I mean, we're, we're going to have a whole other one of these to, to touch on other stuff as well. But um, stand-up tragedy is just absolutely fucking genius. And because I mean, as somebody who has got a lot of stand-up comedy friends and watches a lot of stand-up comedy, it gets a little bit stale. You know, you, you've heard the same, even if the jokes are different, they're the same joke. And the idea of completely turning it on its head, to me, is is the smartest thing that I've ever heard of. But nobody liked it, and it wasn't a. Nobody liked it really. <laughs> I, I, who, who gives a shit? <laughs> it helped me. Yeah, exactly. Just, just, just the idea of standing on straight stage and putting all of your pain and hurt onto everybody, and yeah. just trying to make them just, cry. Just trying your best to ruin their day. 
She was like, oh my God, it just feels so cathartic. <laughs> it, was, it was for me. And a lot of people say, well, that's not right for others and stuff, it, you know, because they just want to go out and have a good time. You know, it's like Friday night and they go to yeah. the show and stuff like that. But then uh, to me, but I didn't, one thing about it was I didn't like doing it over and over again, like bands and performers, they'll have a new routine yeah. and then they perform the same thing over and over again. But for me, it was my personal stuff my trauma type stuff and I didn't want to just repeat it like automated ro robotic just going through the motions and stuff I it wanted to feels like you're losing the truth of it slightly right, if you're, right. yeah. and so that way I was able to um, I would always if I went on tour as many shows as I would have I would have to prepare a different totally yeah. different show just so I could change it based on whatever I I felt how, how much of it was prepared and how much of it was just stream of consciousness oh, just all, none of it all of it was prepared all prepared right okay yeah obsessively never never let anything just happen spontaneously it's amazing, it's amazing. that's absolutely amazing to me because I've seen some clips of it and like the the illusion of it being just completely raw and of the moment is is there definitely <laughs> Well, the way I wrote the pieces was I would just say one thing, like one statement or something, and I would just repeat it over and over again, like uh, autistic, like I was autistic and I would just rock back and forth and I would just say the one thing over and over again until the next thing just automatically popped out. And so that was kind of sub conscious in the formulation yeah. but after i would repeat it 80 times and have 80 lines or whatever memorized then it doesn't have any of that spontaneity anymore but it's naturally generated spontaneity so then when i would do it the cadence and stuff i could totally play with that and just really jam the people's brains and i had videos and uh, audio to try to get as much sensory stimulation at the people as possible because this is hard to make people cry. Uh, I, I, I would have paid money to not be in the audience, but to be to watch the audience. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to just see them fall apart i i think that, that that's i think that's where the true beauty of that would be is just filming the audience during one of those performances different yeah. things made different people cry so you couldn't just get the whole everyone in the audience to cry all at once like different no. things would get different people but one time i did a show in nashville but it wasn't it was more performance art not necessarily stand-up tragedy this goes with the crime and nourishment theme too uh somebody in texas sent me an old-fashioned cassette tape mm -hmm. that, that a woman had recorded in tennessee of the police torturing her husband and um so, but in Tennessee here, it wasn't big deal. It wasn't in the news. It wasn't in the national news and stuff like this, but they really tortured the hell out of this guy. It was like three, I think it was three detect, two detectives and three police officers. And like the first thing you hear is like this clicking of the record button. And then you hear like some papers shuffling, like she was trying to cover up the boom box or the Walkman or whatever with this papers. And then you hear this cop say, where are you going to be at? she's down here at the store and then he's like okay because i don't want that boy seeing this mess like that and as soon as the door closes they just start beating the hell out of this guy and his name was eugene and so then like they go through they wanted him to sign a consent form giving them permission to search his house his trailer but he wouldn't sign it and they would up the torture they would like up the violence and he would up his willingness to cooperate, but he kept refusing to sign the form. So that just kept escalating this abuse on torture and stuff. So then I did, um, uh, they shocked his genitals. They put cigarettes out on his tongue. They tried to drown him, uh, simulate drowning him. They found a BB gun and they threatened to shoot him in the head and plant the BB gun on him and all this stuff on this tape recorder. So I did, a, I turned it into a one 
one act play, uh, one person play and I had took a pillowcase and on one side of it I did an iron on of the victim's face so it kind of looked like his face but it was a little bit warped with the pillow wrinkles but then when I turned it around and I was acting out the police I cut holes in the eyes and I turned up be the KKK and so then I would either be the clan or I would be the victim and uh, I did all of these abuses on myself. Well, th this guy asked me if I would do perform at a birthday party in Nashville, but I didn't really know these people very well at all. But I thought, okay, I'm going to do something Tennessee related. And I got this tape and everything. So I got all these props and stuff. And so I went and, and I had a person do, the name of the play was called Sign It. And I used the real audio of them torturing this guy. And at the diner, the same diner, I was talking about that gravy. Uh, there was a, 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 a server there whose parents were deaf, so she knew sign language. So on the big screen, I had her sign and everything that they were saying. But in the little screen where normally people are signing, I had whoever is saying something on the tape i had their face a photograph of their face for as long as they're saying it so if the policeman said stand him up and i'll take his pants down then you'd see the policeman who said that's face but then if it was the victim going oh, oh, you'd see his picture go oh, oh, like that so i get wow. to this house in in nashville and uh, have no idea who's they in who, who the people are or anything well they're all shooting up cocaine, sharing needles and shooting up cocaine. And I didn't know anything about this. And so the police, this goes to what you were saying about wanting to watch the audience. I didn't, I couldn't really see because I had this pillowcase on my head the whole time. But uh, on the video, uh, I had two different people videotaping it. And all of these people were on drugs. And the whole thing was about this, just the worst abuse you'd ever hear in your life. The police abusing people, trying to sign it. Everybody's face was just priceless like you just couldn't plan for something like that it, and then we could amaze it and the next, that that night my girlfriend she was like i'll pay for a, a hotel we can't sleep here there were needles and stuff in the basement everywhere where we had to mat blow up mattress and everything and uh, so we left and then the next morning when we came back like a part of the part of the play this is funny that they the guy kept saying sign sign or read the paper to me can you read it to me can you read the form for me and they say i ain't reading a fucking thing but then at one point one of the cops starts reading it to him it was all this like legalese like official language i eugene siler declared it's given permission for the police to be here but at the very end of them reading it one of the cops says let's give him a haircut <laughs> like that. and so i typed the thing up exactly the way they said it i got an exa a form and just yeah. photocopied it out and so while that part while they're reading it to him i was like passing out these forms to all these people that were shooting up coke oh my god the next morning when i went i thought well when we leave town i need to at least go by and say thanks for having me and stuff mm -hmm. and the whole place had been totally trashed and there was like all these consent search forms all over the house and stuff it looked just like it had been raided man it was crazy no. That's fucking awesome. Was so I, think, I think that was about the best place we could uh, we could choose to end on. <laughs> that, that was an amazing story. I love it. So, right, I'm going to go away and I'm going to figure right. out and get some bits together and make you right. your last meal. We'll, awesome. talk, we'll talk via email. And, um, awesome. and whether it's this week, next week, whatever, we'll figure it out. We'll book a time. And then the next Ooh. time you see us, we will be ready for digging in. Awesome. Thanks for having right, me. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on, man. It's been a pleasure, and I will, uh, I'll speak to you soon. All right, bye.